And thank you all for coming to this session. And I'm just delighted to introduce Dr. Samantha Poulos, um, who's going to speak to us about using student voice uh, to measure success and impact. So we've got about 15 minutes of presentation, then about five of Q&A. So join me in welcoming Samantha. Thank you. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, my name's Samantha. You can call me Sam. Um, visual representation. I'm wearing a caramel coloured shirt. I'm a sort of tallish uh, female presenting person. I do use they, them pronouns. I have uh, a lot of brown regrowth on my pink hair, so I can't quite accurately describe what my hair looks like other than a mess that's tied back. Um, and today I will be talking about using the student voice to measure success and impact of UDL. And it's just going to be a very informal, very casual talk and a snapshot of some of the ongoing projects that we've got at the University of Sydney. Um, oh no. Is it, how do I go to the next slide? There we go, okay. So before I begin, I'd like to acknowledge and pay respect to the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nations as the traditional owners on the land on which RMIT stands. Um, and I would also specifically like to acknowledge and pay respect to the traditional owners of the land on which the University of Sydney is built. It's the Gadigal of the Eora Nation. It is on their lands that this work was conducted. Um, and I pay respect to elders past, present, and any First Nations people in attendance or on Zoom. I can see you all from there. As we share our knowledge, teaching, learning, and research practices within this space, uh, may we also pay respect to the knowledge embedded forever in Aboriginal custodianship of country. And as we think about this idea of including student voice, we have to think about what that means, who these students are, how are we inviting their voices, are we making sure there is space for voices to be heard? And then once these voices are heard, what are we actually doing with that information? So we'll go to the next slide. Oh gosh. I actually don't know how I'm supposed to go to the next slide. Is it the clicker? Okay, great. So what does measuring UDL look like? Okay, I can see I'm not really in the camera focus either. So the UDL reporting criteria, the UDL RC, was created in 2017. And um, it's a way of, it was created as like a checklist of things that we can use to measure UDL implementation and success. Uh, I had a bit of an issue while applying this sort of reporting criteria to tertiary education, specifically because teaching and learning at the university level, or at least at Sydney University, is forever changing. And what I mean by that is that we don't get to work with our academics for a very long time. Units change coordinators. There's 13 weeks in a semester. Sometimes we get to talk to them for the two weeks before, and then after that, they kind of disappear. Units are transferred to different coordinators, depending on semesters. Sometimes we'll work with a coordinator in semester one, and then we won't see them again for six months until semester one the next year. So it makes it difficult to track what success looks like, what did the UDL implementation, what was um, actually effective and what wasn't. So we also encounter this question of measuring success is, am I measuring the success of UDL being implemented in the courses at the university? Um, for example, is, are we measuring the use of UDL language of the unit coordinators? Are we measuring the success being that they're offering opportunities and options for students? Is it that they're having alternative assessments? Or are we trying to measure if and by how much UDL implementation has helped accomplish the University of Sydney's 2023 strategic goals and bridging achievement gaps? So this is asking instead, what's the success of our ongoing project? And when I say our project, um, I'm talking of the work that myself, Ella Collins-White, um, you've definitely seen Sarah Humphreys running around Korea, Kimberly is also here. Um, what we do in educational innovation, are we trying to measure the success of our project? And what that means is a changing mindset and an improvement on teaching and learning at the university. Um, good news is I don't have an answer. So I'm not gonna have an answer to which question am I asking either. So it's gonna be a lot of questions happening in this talk. Um, so as previously thought of, and I've got a quote to support this, there's no consensus in the UDL community about what exactly UDL is and what it looks like in application which is just great when you're trying to measure success on any front. So what we've decided to do is measure um, success in our own ways and measure them in specific to each unit of practice that we're working with. So what I'm thinking here is how are we measuring the success of the UDL in each unit rather than the success of our practice overall. Um, 
And what this looks like is having a clear indication of changes already implemented in courses with a clear statement of learning design and measuring the impact and success of these changes. So what this means is we get to go in and work with units. We go, we talk to the um, academics, we talk with them through what we call the designing for diversity process. So questioning who are your learners, what is your context, what are the barriers that they're facing, what solutions can we implement, and how can we iterate and evaluate. So on projects that we've already worked with, we then try and include a statement of learning design on our Canvas homepages saying, this is what active design elements have gone into this course to improve teaching and learning. So we're making it very clear to the students, here's what we've done. You know, we're not keeping secrets from the students. We're making things quite explicit. And then what we can do is measure against these changes rather than saying, were there any changes made? We can say, yes, we've made changes. Can we measure to that? And that's a way to find measures of success. Here's another quote for you all from the UDL reporting criteria, is that UDL provides guidelines for addressing learner variability and designing learning environments that are supportive for all learners, which we all know. So what we do is set measures of success by inviting student voice. So it's not enough for us to assume what will be successful. We actually have to ask the students what worked, what did you like, what didn't you like, we told you in the statement of learning design that we've included PowerPoint slides to be available so that you can, you know, read the material before you come into class. Was that effective? Did you find that useful to your learning? Rather than us making assumptions about what students need and want, we actually need to be asking them, did this help? Was this useful? Let me just check my notes. Okay. So. Here's a couple of projects that we've worked on. So one of the case studies I've been dealing with this semester is two first year economics units. So context and who are our learners, they're two first year economics units, extremely large cohorts. Um, the students are feeling very overwhelmed. There's a lot of new information. Economics has a lot of jargon that they're dealing with. But in particular, I'm working with the unit coordinators and the barriers that we found with the unit coordinators is that they already felt that they were at capacity. So one unit coordinator actually said to us, you know, I don't know what more I can be doing. So this is what we're coming up against. Another unit coordinator, when we said, you know, what are the barriers that your students are facing? What changes can we be making? Said, well, I don't know. You know, I, I can't think of any changes that I could possibly be doing. What barriers are there in the environment? Um, and there was actually a little bit of misplaced uh, identifying of barriers, saying that the barrier was the students, actually. I've done everything I can. It's the students need to meet me halfway, which we know is not necessarily the most useful or helpful way to think about these things. So when we're approaching a, a project like this, obviously we don't know where to start. So let's start with the basics. So for one of these um, units, which is where the, uh, the unit coordinator felt like the issues were his students, we said, well, what actually is the problem here? And he said, I get too many emails. All the information that the students need, it's on the Canvas site, and they just keep emailing me about it. And we said, okay, well, what if we put an FAQ, a Frequently Asked Questions page, on the home page? What if we synthesize all the information that you already had? We just put it on the home page. You know, we're not actually thinking about big changes here. We're just saying, can we just do this one thing in your unit? We don't have to touch more. You don't have to think about this. We'll put it on there, and then we'll ask students about it. So that was the intervention that we made. And then we also, um, for the next unit, so we ran surveys in both of them, they're sister units, it's 101 and 102. For the other unit where the coordinator felt like he was doing all that he could, he was sending weekly emails to students of wrap ups, like this is what you learned this week, this is what you're gonna prepare for next week. And he was like, well, I'm doing everything I can. So we were like, okay, well, why don't we ask the students, do they like those emails? You're seeing click through rates, but what does that mean? You know, you're seeing students sometimes open them, sometimes not open them, rather than us making any more changes because you're already doing what I think is quite good practice, setting up these expectations of next week, we were eliminating threats and distractions. We're saying, here's what you've learned, setting up goals for next week. You're already doing great practice. What if we ask the students, is this effective? Is it working? So we ran a survey, it was an anonymous survey, open for a week to both cohorts of students. Um, when they entered the survey, they were entered into a lucky draw to win uh, one of 10 $50 vouchers. So that's 20 $50 vouchers across the two units. Um, and despite all of that, we still had incredibly low numbers of submissions. So the units had over three or four, 500 students, and we only got about 60 surveys per unit. 
So it's incredibly low, but what it gave us was targeted feedback. So in the one where we put the FAQ, we directly asked, did you like this change on the homepage? What other Canvas sites do you like? Because we have access to look at all the Canvas sites across the university. We're like, oh, five minutes. Gosh, I've talked a lot, a lot more than I thought I would. So all of this to say, quickly wrapping up there, is that asking students directly about the changes we've made gave us ideas of what to do next time. So these unit coordinators are actually not teaching this unit again. So classic economics, they change unit coordinators every semester. So any changes that we want to make to the unit, we have to actually ask the students because we're going to have same students effectively next semester. So what we're going to do next is use these to create markers of success for our next iteration. So we're going to say we made these changes based on what the students came before you said. Another case study we've been working with is a large uh, first year pharmacy unit. They've already undergone the designing for diversity process. So they're a little bit later stage. So they've got the statement of learning design. They've already made changes. We've talked about UDL at nauseum with their coordinators. And what we decided to do here was run focus groups with the students. Um, and we paid them, again, $50 to come and give us direct feedback on the Canvas site and their feelings of belonging. This is a key goal of this iteration of this unit and a key goal of the University of Sydney's strategic plan is to create feelings of inclusion and belonging at the university. So we asked them directly and it was a great way to get students to bounce off each other to tell us because we're not associated with pharmacy, we work university wide. So they were able to be quite frank with us. And it was a great way to measure the success of the project that we'd done and then also find out, did the changes make impact? So one of them was, we introduced an activity about belonging. Did you like it? Students were like, oh, I felt like I belonged, but actually I didn't notice that that was an activity because <laughs> we named it. We're like, did you enjoy the welcome to Sydney? They're like, what was that? We're like, oh, okay. So it, it was effective, but it wasn't effective in the way we thought it would be. It also gave us barriers to consider in future interventions. Students were like, well, you know, the class was really interactive, but when I watched the recording, there were no headings. I couldn't see the slides. The unit coordinator didn't speak into the microphone. Those aren't things we would have noticed beforehand. And that's not an issue that the unit coordinator could come up with. So this is a way for us to come up with um, barriers to consider in future interventions and come up with more successful projects by asking students what will actually benefit you. And lastly, what I wanted to say, and this is speaking to the success of UDL implementation across um, the University of Sydney, so success of perhaps our project, is that the unit coordinators being open to student voices in itself is a success. These surveys and focus groups, the direct invocation of student voice, shows a commitment from the academic staff to putting students first. It's a measurable impact of UDL implementation. It's a way to say, well, rather than you having to be the sage on the stage and the sage coming up with the successful um, breaking down of barriers, we can co-create our learning environment. It's actively um, encouraging that UDL co-creation. I got another quote for you all. Um, thinking that comprehensive use of UDL includes a consideration of designing learning environments for all, an essential aspect that distinguishes UDL from incidental use of varied supports for learners. So rather than these teachers just incidentally doing good practice or incidentally applying um, you know, the academic plans for some students, what we're trying to do is show this intentionality by having these conversations and having these unit coordinators be open to conversations and to being challenged by their students and actually hearing from them, we're seeing this sort of success in the UDL implementation. So being an intentional change in consideration of student needs, not incidental and not just an accidental good teaching. So as I started out, I said I wouldn't have any clear answers and I, as I've said, I actually don't. What I've got is just some examples. So we've got some examples of what it is to measure success in the projects that we're working on in the units and what it is to try and measure the success of our long-term goal of designing for diversity, of implementing UDL at the university. Um, and that's the conclusion, therefore, is that it's an evolving process. Uh, it's never ending. It's always a project that we're going to be thinking about and trying to evaluate. And that evaluation can't come from us. We can't just sit down and say, well, it looked like a success, it was a success. We have to think about 
who are we asking, what voices are we including, and then how can we use those voices to find points to change in the future and then measure against. So these are the citations that I use. It's the reporting criteria uh, and the validation of the reporting criteria. If you have any further questions about the projects or anything I've talked about, this is my email address. Um, and that's it for me. So any questions? Gorgeous, Samantha, right on time, magnificent. We love that because now we've got time for questions. So Jesse from my team is just bounding up the, the stairs uh, to hand a mic over. Hi, um, thank you for that. That was really exciting to hear. Um, I, I work, I'm a learning designer at Monash College. Mm. And last year we did a really a similar, maybe smaller scale thing where we had an action research project where we asked, um, yeah, we, we took a few units that we'd kind of uh, intentionally integrated UDL principles into, and then we asked students, you know, yeah, if, yeah. if it had landed, basically. Mm. But I guess my question, to do that, and it was really great, we did kind of a, an adapted user testing process, mm. which was great, and it gave us really rich data, but our question now is, I guess, around, you know, that was a lot very intensive, terms of our time and students' time. Um, so I'm curious um, if you have any insights about how to make just that process of getting the student mm -hmm. feedback more sustainable. Um, and then maybe in addition to that, how and if it kind of links into, because we have the student um, evaluations at the end of each unit, mm. but that is currently kind of separate, I guess, from yes. getting feedback about the design and the UDL parts. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, again, the unfortunate news is I don't have answers on how to make it more sustainable. We're very fortunate in the project that we are working on um, falls under the University of Sydney's strategic goals. So there's currently a little bit of funding in there for us to actually you know, have these labor intensive conversations to pay our students. And this is it, even though we offered them $50 to talk to us, they didn't do it. So thinking about you know it's obviously there are barriers even to doing that um so i don't have a more sustainable way i'm just very thankful that i have the opportunity and the time to commit to doing this work and i wish eventually we do all have a more sustainable and easy way and also the fact that yeah you're right it doesn't align to the um end of semester feedback forms because this information comes to us the educational innovation team and does not go back to the unit coordinators we act as conduit for it. We um, get the student feedback, we write up reports, and then we talk to the unit coordinators about the project. So there is a bit of a mismatch in that. Um, again, it is only through the thankful benefit of us having this time in this project to be able to do this work, but it's not synthesized yet. And this is like the first time we've actually started thinking about, well, what is the end goal? What is the success? How are we evaluating what we're doing? Um, Another question here. Thank you. Um, I've been doing some research on um, student, students um, and students studying who have poor mental health, mental illness, depending on how you frame that. Mm. One of the ways that's worked, I mean, I've got a whole bunch of ideas and strategies for that, but because that's a difficult group to ask and like mm. get through ethics and all the rest of it, rightfully so. But one of the things I found would get responses if you disclose. Mm. Like, that, that, I mean, I can, I can do that. Not everyone can or wants to. And so when I was asking them about that, and even in my subjects, I flag, I'm neurodivergent. Mm. I've had poor mental health from time to time. This is how I've designed the subject with that in mind, blah, blah. Mm. And I get emails before I ask them anything because they're grateful that someone has said, like opened that conversation yeah. and care enough to ask how you can help them mm. in a non-judgmental way. Now, that doesn't help the whole, you know, there's another subject coordinator comes along and, and yeah. all the rest of it. But that, that openness and disclosure in a way that feels mm. safe for you has enormous yeah. impact because suddenly you're safe or safer at least. Yeah. Um, and you're asking from a, a, an empathetic perspective, not a, you, you need to, you know, tell us all your 
you know, all that kind of stuff. Mm. So for what that's worth, that that can yeah. help. And I'm not sure what, yeah, the, yeah. You know, how the students respond to that. So I, I mean, I have personal experience of this. I was a, I casual tutored um, in the English department and FAS generally for a few years before I moved into this role, but thankfully I don't have to come up with teaching plans anymore. Um, and I do feel like being vulnerable to students in a way that you're comfortable with, you shouldn't be uh, disclosing any information that you as a, a professional is, are not interested in disclosing. Um, but that does help students feel welcomed and be able to communicate with you. And one of the welcome to Sydney activity that I mentioned earlier, the uh, activity itself actually invites um, the teachers to talk about their journey to the university and what that means is rather than just being like, oh, I did my PhD and now I'm a smart academic. It's, you know, I failed my first year philosophy unit and now I'm here. Um, I always tell my students, I actually got told not to continue English studies at HSC level because I was so bad at poetry. And now I teach intro to poetry at the University of Sydney. This could be you. Um, so actually having those activities where we try and foster that feeling of belonging at the start let students be more open. It was those students actually that we heard more from because they felt more open and responsive. Some of the students in the focus group were saying to us, like, they're like, oh, I don't want to name names. That's something, you know, one of them had quite a not great experience in one of the lectures and they're like, oh, one of the lecturers, oh. And then in the group, everyone was like, oh, that teacher, yeah, okay. And I was like, okay, so clearly you all know something that you're not telling your teachers. Thankfully, because we're in education innovation, we're not part of their faculty. So we're like, you can tell us stuff. You can tell us secrets and we won't tell them. Um, so from that, we found out like a teacher was using a laser pointer and pointing out students, um, which is just slack. But like those are things students wouldn't tell their teachers. But that's something they would tell us because we came in and we said, we're here exclusively to hear from you because we know we could be doing better. And because we know there are things that you talk about with your friends that you do not tell your teachers. And that is the stuff that we need to find more of and give space to hear from. And I think starting out that feeling of belonging and that value, when we think about valuing student voice as well is showing a commitment to you telling me this information will be used. You're not just gonna tell me this happened. I'm gonna say, okay, next time we will make sure this doesn't happen or that this happens differently and we'll see how that changes. Um, Sorry, Greg. Are we running out of question yeah. time? I talked too long. Um, please feel free to find me in the lobby. Um, anyone online, if you want to hear more about me, you can email me. Find me on LinkedIn. I'm apparently on that now as well. Um, otherwise, thank you all for your time. Thanks so much, Sam. And what a great thing to finish on, that sense of um, genuine inclusion and belonging and really um, valuing and affirming the diversity of our students. So thank you so much.